In today's video, we're going to look at Norway again, the three largest undeveloped discoveries. This came from an article that was uh, published in Upstream back in January 2025. And as you can see here, this very handsome silver fox gentleman, Torger Stordal, he made this statement saying, yeah, we've got these three fields and uh, they certainly need to be moved forward to production. Now, there isn't much uh, reserves or resource size quoted within the, uh, the article or, or elsewhere, but let's just have a quick look at these three. Start off with what they are. Well, we can see here from the Norwegian Offshore Directorate, or NOD, that it's the Wisting Field in the Barents Sea, Linorm in the Norwegian Sea, and Pion in the North Sea. Now, starting with a quick look at Wisting. Now, Wisting was uh, Amundsen's second-in-command during his polar expedition. So if you're wondering where the name comes from, there you go, second-in-command. Now here is the location map for Wisting. It's about 300 kilometers offshore and about 160 kilometers from the nearest producing field, which now is Johan Kasper, which recently came on production. The water depth here, 400 meters. It's an interesting field. I'll show you why. So on the left here, you can see a seismic RMS, root mean squared amplitude map. The areas that are shining brightly in the yellows and reds, they're presumably coinciding with the, the oil-bearing or gas-bearing uh, structures. In this case, it's uh, an oil. There is the Wisting Central, shown here as WC, and then there's Wisting Central West to the west and Wisting Central South to the west. Hmm. Equinor the operator with 35% and Akabipe, Petoro and Inpex are the other partners. Now it's a Jurassic reservoir, so quite an old reservoir, but it's only 237 metres below the seabed, which is incredibly shallow for the Jurassic. And it has been an area that has been significantly uplifted and a lot of erosion has been uh, taking place in the past. It's a very compartmentalized reservoir. It contains around about 500 million barrels of oil equivalent. And the oil is a 36 API gravity. So what we'd expect from these sorts of depths would that, that the oil, the crude, would be very, very highly biodegraded and actually quite a, a gloopy, very low API gravity. But this seems to be quite a, a live oil. It's the Stir Formation Reservoir. So uh, again, Jurassic Age. Uh, you can see some of the wells there, the horizontal well uh, drilled from Wisting Central and a number of appraisal wells. Here is the montage that comes from uh, the Trove database we have for this region. Lots of information, cross-sections, write-ups, reports, log correlations, reservoir correlation sections, all sorts of material and talking about where it's up to in the process and some development plan ideas. Awful lot of information within Trove. Now, moving on swiftly to Linorm. What is Linorm? Linorm, well, that's a mythological creature. I think it's some kind of a flying dragon or something. Here's the location highlighted. 604 is the uh, quadrant and it's block 9, well 1. It's an HPHT gas field. That means it's very high pressure, very high temperature. It's located in the Norwegian Sea, a water depth of around about 300 metres. It could either be tied back to the Kristen facility or onto Asgard. So there they are highlighted on the map. Now the history of Linorm, discovered in 2005 by Shell on Holtenbanken, which is a geological feature, a high in the Norwegian Sea. The discovery well found 100 metres of net column uh, of gas and condensate, gas condensate. Six reservoir layers, variable permeability, 5,000 metres below seabed. This is deep. Six months to drill a well. These take quite some time. Now, the concept select for Linorm was taken back in 2011. Here we are in 2025. It hasn't been sanctioned and it hasn't moved forward to development. Now, in terms of resource size, the contingent resources for this of the order of about one TCF of gas, trillion cubic feet. Equinor operate with 50% equity. Petoro and Total Energies are the partners. Technical challenges, we've actually reviewed this before. Very high pressure, 800 bar, that's a very high pressure. Temperature, 180 degrees centigrade. 7% carbon dioxide, 30 ppm of hydrogen sulfide. It's going to require corrosion resistant alloys. There's a high carbonate scale potential. Some of the wells likely to scale up if uh, not frequently treated with scale squeezes. 
This is where you pump down chemicals into the reservoir to ensure that you don't get the deposition of scale either in the near wellbore environment or indeed in the tubing going back up to the production facility. There's a little illustration, this little picture here. There's a pipeline that's got filled with scale, very, very little area left for fluids to, to flow through. And, and this deposition can actually happen in a matter of days worst case examples. There's also, there's a risk of gas hydrate and wax. So there's a requirement to, to keep the well stream above 30 degrees centigrade. In terms of the flow assurance, you have to insulate the flow line. You have to uh, ensure that there's direct electrical heating or shutdown without depressurization. So you've got to keep the pipe warm when the oil isn't flowing through it. Methanol injection, at unheated spools and rises during shutdown. So a good way of getting rid and stopping preventing uh, hydrates and things forming is to actually pump down methanol. It also, it's, it's a good solvent and would actually take away some of the waxy products. Potential scale inhibitor injection below the uh, subsea safety valve and upstream of the production choke. Well, I'm not a production specialist, so... Uh, those who know what that means, uh, they'll understand that. The flow line has got a 16 inch internal diameter and it's designed for 300 bars of pressure. The flowing wellhead temperature range expect it to be 145 to 175 degrees centigrade. So it's cooled from the 180 that it would be at in the, uh, in the reservoir. There's our montage for Linorm and again, lots of information Every field in the world has lots and lots of information. If you want to get global coverage, get Trove. Finally, peon. A peon is a, is a peasant or a worker. I don't know if that's where the name comes from, but uh, that's all we could find. So here's a map showing where peon is. It's a massive shallow gas field. It's over to the east of the main fields like Gullfact, Statfjord, Murchison, Snora. So that's the Brent province over there. Now, peon is uh, very, very different to all of those Brent oil fields. And uh, the discovery, well, it's a shallow gas deposit about 100 kilometers west of Floro, highlighted on the map again, discovered back in 2005, a very shallow reservoir, 574 meters below mean sea level. And the water depth is 384 meters. So that's a, a very thin uh, sedimentary and overburden that's actually retaining the gas within that reservoir. Approximately 35 giga standard cubic meters of gas initially in place. And the project, well, when this slide was put together, was in the concept select phase. But that was ex when it was expected to start production back in 2014. Well, obviously that didn't happen because here we are today in 2025 and uh, still awaiting sanction of this uh, particular project. The operator, well, it's uh, the name change. It's now Equinor, 72.4%. Patoro and Idemitsu, the Japanese company with uh, are the partners. So there's a seismic line that shows the Peon Reservoir. Yeah, well constrained. There's uh, shown there as having a, a gas water contact quite well down. There is also an unconformity within that sequence there, but the uh, TT is uh, an interpreted tiltung unit. I'm not sure what a tiltung is, but um, it's uh, thick over to the north and thins quite a lot over to the south. I'll just point that out here. Here's the TT unit, very thick in the north, thinning right out here to the south. So quite uh, unusual. It's, it's hardly the, the layer cake geology that you might expect in some of these uh, shallower units here. Now here's the model for Peon. Very, very recent sediments. It's actually Pleistocene age. That's somewhere between 0 0.01 and 1.8 million years old. It's thought that it was actually a subglacial depositional system passing into a glacial marine depositional system. These glaciers moving out across a, a Pliocene sedimentary wedge, eroding and deforming beds as it went. And then uh, at some point here was this accumulation of uh, an outwash ridge with gravel and sands. So it's a glacial outwash deposit very recent sediment and uh, despite the fact it's actually come from uh, glacial outwashings it's a very homogeneous reservoir. Gas source for this very very unclear likely to be a biogenic gas origin. 
Here you can see on a map, you can see this anomaly that's uh, highlighted here. And this polygon defines the extent. Of now, in terms of reservoir properties, it's a huge, huge area. 250 square kilometers of unconsolidated homogeneous sandstone with a net growth of 0 0.099. So almost completely sandstone, hardly any shale or clay within it. Unconsolidated, the rock has not been uh, compacted enough to be a hard sandstone. These sands would actually flow as you uh, start to take the gas out of the formations. And uh, very, very young, there's the depths shown here. So 384 water, 165 meters of uh, overburden. And then we have a, a 19 meter gas column shown here, overlying a, a 40 meter oil column. It's not a huge seal capacity required, but still significant that we can actually retain that thickness of hydrocarbon underneath such a thin overburden. 883 PSI is the, well, that's how I converted 59.7 bar, which gives a, a pressure gradient of around about 0.46 PSI per foot. Now that's a hydrostatic gradient and I wouldn't have expected anything else at this shallow depth. The permeability of the sands, well, maybe up to four Darcy's permeability, excellent sands, but unconsolidated. So you're going to have to put in sort of sand screens to try and hold them back for if, uh, if you put this thing on production. And uh, here we're saying a gas column of 0 to 25, but you subtract those numbers, and it's actually uh, comes out at 19. Anyway, there is an analogue in the UK sector, and that's Aviat. Now, Aviat doesn't get an awful lot of attention as a field, but it's a very, very shallow field. It's, again, it's Pleistocene. About 22 billion cubic feet of gas has been produced from the two wells on here. And the gas never actually makes it all the way to shore. The gas is actually used to fuel the platforms in the 40s fields. So uh, again, I think a biogenic gas there. In terms of development plan for Peon, well, not yet to be sanctioned, but looking at maybe three to five subsea wells, tie back to existing infrastructure. Um, so that's a Goldfax C potentially. A number of other tiebacks uh, were considered low pressure compared to other subsea developments that's one of the uh, problems with very very shallow gas it doesn't really expand a huge amount as it comes to surface deep gas expands a huge amount so uh, you know one cubic kilometer of gas in the ground at depth could expand hundreds of times as it gets to the surface and could be very very significant so with lower pressures this isn't going to be expanding quite as much as deeper pools. A long pipeline, an uphill transportation, well, it's doable, but uh, just got to make sure that there aren't any flow assurance issues. So production with pressure depletion, you're not going to uh, probably have injectors in this. The well rates, 3 million standard cubic meters a day or 8 million standard cubits a day for field wide for that's the three to five wells. And uh, the uh, uh, compressor, uh, at the host because this will be coming to the platform at a very low pressure and so it will require energy to pressure it up so it can be then transported back to the beach or to wherever. Some challenges with Peon but uh, looks interesting, looks like it'd be a great clean energy resource and that would really fit with the sort of transition uh, expectations. So there's the montage we have in, uh, in Trove. Not as much as others we have, but lots of detail and information. You can see various seismic lines, descriptions of the reservoir, more of a write-up on the extent of the anomaly, basically a description of what's been happening. But what we want to hear happening is that the uh, project's being sanctioned. Well, we normally do a summary slide, but uh, really we've uh, it's quite a short video and we've described the three opportunities and now we await project sanction. So uh, watch this space. Thank you for watching the video. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, ring the bell, all that usual stuff. It does help us and guys to afford to keep this uh, channel going. If you can support us, please do. Become a member. It doesn't cost an awful lot, but it will certainly help uh, pay for the, the huge overhead in producing these videos. Thanks very much for watching. Hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Bye for now.